Hey, everybody. Time again for the Big Bout Podcast. John Suntress here, your host. We continue our theme of the Dempsey-Tunney long count fight, the rematch that uh, shook the world in 1927, September 22nd, this Saturday, the 91st anniversary of the long count. We all know the story. Dempsey is losing the fight just as he did the first time. In the seventh round, he manages to rain punches on Gene Tunney in the corner, knocking him down. Tunney looks like he's in a stupor. The neutral corner rule, it's a brand new thing. Dempsey forgets. Referee Dave Barry tries to rush him to the corner, but doesn't start the count until Dempsey is in that neutral corner. Tunney is down for 14 seconds. He gets up. He manages to get on his bicycle, survive the round, goes right back to fighting his aggressive fight, and easily wins the 10-round decision, retaining his title as heavyweight champion. Mostly the focus is always on Jack Dempsey when it comes to the Dempsey-Tunney rivalry. Tunney won both fights. It's not Tunney-Dempsey. It's Dempsey-Tunney as far as our history goes. Dempsey was the Babe Ruth of boxing, and as you heard on my uh, documentary, lots of people felt he was bigger than Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was envious of Jack Dempsey. He was a great figure. He sat on his title for three years. Again, Gene Tunney's story always gets lost in the shuffle. Tunney was an incredible fighter. He fought amazing name fighters and beat them to a pulp. Not just Jack Dempsey, Harry Greb, Carpentier, so many other greats of the 20s. You have to give it to Gene Tunney. Thankfully, there was an author, Jack Cavanaugh, an excellent sports writer, who wrote an incredible biography of Gene Tunney. The name of the book is Tunney, Boxing's Brainiest Champ and His Upset of the Great Jack Dempsey. It came out in 2009. I was fortunate enough to talk to Jack about Gene Tunney in 2002 in preparation for my documentary, at the time the 75th anniversary of the Long Count fight. Now, you heard quotes in that 28-minute presentation my first episode of the Big Bot Podcast. If you haven't heard it, go back and listen to episode one. But you really didn't get the full Gene Tunney story. You just got the essence. I wanted to present my full interview with Jack Cavanaugh, again, from 2002. I think it'd be great in a future episode to have Jack back on and talk about whatever he discovered in the ensuing seven years and uh, give people a proper uh, opportunity to go back and pick up this 2009 book. It's on Amazon. You can get it. Jack has also written a great book about the New York Giants, about George Gipp, and about the baseball season of 42, as he puts it. Joe D., Teddy Ball game, and baseball's fight to survive a turbulent first year of war. The Giants book just came out last year, in fact. And that book is called Giants Among Men, How Robustelli, Boo Boo Huff, Frank Gifford, and the Giants made New York a football town and changed the NFL. Pretty neat stuff. So it's going to be a pleasure to talk to Jack, hopefully, in the future. I hope he'll uh, take my request and come back to the Big Bout podcast. So let's give Gene Tunney his due, especially as we celebrate the 91st anniversary of his huge win against Jack Dempsey, cementing his place in boxing history. And again, we have Jack Cavanaugh to plead the case that maybe Gene Tunney's star should be a little bit higher in the boxing cosmos. Here's Jack Cavanaugh on the Big Bout Podcast. Okay, terrific. I appreciate your time right. and your participation. And again, I'm, I'm more than willing to uh, plug the book. Uh, you know, it, it, do you have a title? Or, uh, you know, I mean, are you, are you still putting it together? Well, as of now, it's... Uh uh, that's, the title has not been decided, but it's something to the effect of the, uh, the, the life and times of Gene Tunney, uh, boxing, boxing's brainiest champion. That's what the uh, my Random House editor wanted to get wanted to get in the fact that uh, here we had Tunney, who was not only a, a great fighter, but obviously an intellect, you know, and very intelligent guy. And uh, but something like that. It's probably, it's probably not going to wind up that. But then we have a lot of time. Well, we could say forthcoming biography. You know, we're probably two years away from publication because I've just started writing it, start working on it. Certainly, certainly. So if you can, if you can make a re- that kind of a reference to, to the fact that uh, the book is is about the life and times of Gene Tunney, without necessarily giving it a title, because it hasn't got any title. No, I understand. Because, because a lot of it is going to cover the era that he that he grew up in in New York and that he fought in. And some of the famous people of the era. Uh, okay. 
for example, Jimmy Walker, the colorful mayor of New York, who was also from Greenwich Village, you know. You know, people like that, and other famous people of that era that, what, that he came in contact with. Well, that's that's one of the questions that I'm going to be asking. Obviously, um, let's let's start with that. Um, some of the some of the celebrities that he rubbed shoulders with. We could start with Jimmy Walker, obviously. Well, Jimmy Walker probably was the uh, biggest celebrity in New York City that uh, Tony knew and knew well. Uh, for one thing, Walker was from Greenwich Village, where Tony grew up. And uh, it was also Jimmy Walker who, in 1920, while a member of the New York State Senate representing Greenwich Village, where, as I say, the Tony family lived, uh, <clears throat> introduced a bill which was passed called the Walker Bill, which legalized boxing in New York State. You have to understand, for numerous times over the years, uh, boxing was illegal, not only in New York, but in uh, most parts of the uh, country. Uh, for example, <clears throat> from 1900 to 1911, it was illegal. Then from uh, 1917 to 1920, uh, when really when Tony was starting his career, having come out of the Marines in 1919, uh, it was illegal. However, boxing bouts were held at what they used to call smokers, uh, mostly in fraternal clubs and also uh, in Knights of Columbus clubs, uh, you had to be a member, but you'd buy a membership by paying a dollar at the at the gate. Uh, you'd become a member, and you could also come on and see the fights. And in those days, before the Walker Bill, 1920, uh, unless you knocked out a fighter, uh, there was no decision. And consequently, if you look up at the records of, of, of fighters like Tunney, uh, back in that era, uh, alongside a lot of his fights, there's an ND, meaning a newspaper decision. It was no decision, but it also meant a newspaper decision. Because there was so much money bet on boxing then as now, uh, what they would do uh, would be uh, survey some of the leading boxing writers at ringside at, at uh, almost every fight. And uh, whatever the majority was meant that fighter won the newspaper decision because these were newspaper sports writers. And uh, that accounts for the fact that uh, Tony, Tony alone, for example, uh, during his career, uh, I think won something like, uh, I don't know, I think he won eight or nine or ten uh, newspaper decisions while losing none. And same thing with uh, Dempsey. Dempsey won a number of uh, fights over the course of his career. Uh, newspaper decisions. It also accounts for the fact that when t when Tony was starting out, he, he really started boxing around 1915, 16, when he was about 18 years old. Then, then of course, he was in the service for about a year and a half. And uh, during much of that time, when he turned professional uh, to make some money, which he couldn't do with the smokers I mentioned, uh, he'd fight a lot over New Jersey, right across the Hudson River. And uh, and that was the case with a lot of fighters. If you, if you wanted to make money and you wanted to fight, you had to fight outside New York State. So Walker uh, was not only a friend, uh, a big fan, a big supporter, but he also was the key figure in uh, uh, getting boxing legalized in 1920, and it's been legal, it's been legal ever since. Um, when he started his career, his professional career, was he, did he start as a middleweight? Uh, when he started, I think his, his first fight, Johnny weighed about 150 pounds. Uh, you got to realize this, this was a tall, gangling, skinny uh, teenager uh, who, you know, who, the reason he got into boxing in the first place, uh, he was always getting beat up by kids in his uh, Greenwich Village neighborhood, uh, which is right alongside the Hudson River. In fact, there were two notorious New York gangs. Uh, one called the uh, the Gophers, one called the Hudson Dusters, and uh, they were. I mean, you had you had gangsters in these gangs, which also if if went down to the teenage level, where they had some junior members, and they'd beat up on guys, particularly guys who were skinny like Tunney, and uh, he'd come home with a bloodied, you know, bloodied nose, bloodied face quite often, and when he was a kid, when he was very young, eight, nine, ten years old, getting beat up by neighborhood bullies because he was so skinny, and, and he didn't really fight back. So his father bought him a pair of boxing gloves when he was 10 years old, mainly to uh, teach him how to defend himself. And uh, uh, it turned out his father was a great boxing fan. He was a huge fan, as were most of the people in that predominantly Irish neighborhood of the great John L. Sullivan, the heavyweight champion back of the uh, 19th century. And uh, matter of fact, that was uh, Gene Tunney's father's idol, uh, John L. Sullivan. So he bought him the gloves. 
to teach them the, the art of self-defense. And ironically, uh, that's what Tony became known as, as a fighter over the years. He became known as a, as a defensive fighter, although, uh, although in, in, in reality, uh, he was never given credit for the fact that he was actually uh, not only a good offensive fighter, but he was a good puncher. A lot of people, he got pegged because he was contrasted with someone like a Dempsey, uh, a brawler, a hard puncher. Uh, he he was he resented the fact as he as he himself put it as, as being called a, a powder puff puncher. Well, he wasn't. Uh, as a matter of fact, he had almost as many knockouts as Dempsey. And uh, contrary to popular belief, just to give you an example, Dempsey had 78 fights. He won 49 by knockouts. Tony had 77 fights, won fewer than Dempsey. And he had 43 knockouts. That's only six less than Dempsey. Mm -hmm. However, half of Dempsey's knockouts, I think it was 24-25, were in the first round. Uh, that wasn't the case with uh, Tunney, whose knockouts, although he had quite a few first-round knockouts, most of them came uh, later on in the fights. He was more of a slashing puncher as well. He could cut up a, a, a fighter, and, and certainly Dempsey is a, is a prime example of that. He, he certainly was. He... he, he he was. He was. Uh, he, he always said, and he uh, he never he never denied the fact that he was primarily uh, a boxer, and 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 he he exactly he was a slashing type of boxer. For example, in the first uh, uh, Dempsey fight in Philadelphia, he just he just cut Dempsey to ribbons. I mean, he, he cuts over his eyes, his nose, his face. He just slashed away at him. Uh, really, no time during that fight, which was a ten rounder, as was the fight in Chicago, the, the famous long count fight, the second fight a year later. Uh, in those days, uh, most heavyweight title fights, at least in, in, uh, in the Northeast and Midwest, were limited to 10 rounds. Uh, ironic because not too many years before that, they were fighting 25, 50 round fights. And, uh, and you know, by the 10th round, uh, I mean, he'd made mincemeat of Dempsey's fight. Dempsey never was in trouble of really being knocked out. But, but uh, I mean, Tony really missed, missed a punch in, in that fight. He won all 10 rounds of the first fight in Philadelphia, all 10 rounds. Uh, in Chicago, uh, he won nine of the ten rounds, losing only the seventh round when he got knocked when he got knocked out and almost got knocked out. Mm -hmm. So he won nineteen of twenty rounds. And in, bo in both cases, in both cases at the end of the fights, uh, Dempsey, Dempsey's uh, uh, you know Dempsey's face was pretty well cut up by the slashing uh, attack of, uh, of of Tony. That was Tony. Tony wasn't a guy. He wasn't a Rocky Marciano, Joe Lewis type of fighter who would knock you out with one one blow. Nor, for that matter, contrary to popular belief, was Dempsey. Dempsey kind of wore you down. He, he wore you down and uh, and then knocked, then knocked you out. He rarely knocked you out. If he caught you with the left hook, which was his best punch, and probably the best left hook in boxing history, he, he could knock you out, certainly. But, but as, as a general rule, uh, he wore you down and then he knocked you out. Unless he caught you early in the first round, and of course he caught a lot of guys early in the first round, especially early in his career. Now I know Tunney was the uh, American light heavyweight champion, and certainly I know that uh, fighters of one weight class would either move up or down to face somebody else, Mickey Walker, uh, even uh, Stanley Ketchell, obviously. But what fights? Because obviously during that time between twenty three and twenty six, Dempsey was not fighting; he was in Hollywood. What fights in that uh, time period? Uh, made uh, Tunney a credible heavyweight contender. Well, I think uh, when he won, he won what was called the American Light Heavyweight Championship in 1922. He beat a guy named Battling Levinsky. He was a pretty good fighter. He won a 12-round decision in New York, and uh, that's when people really began to pay attention. But by then, by then, he had won like you know about 25 fights in a row. Uh, but the but the fight that first really made him well known. After that, there were a bunch of guys that. Uh, uh, you know, were household names only in their own households. Uh, then that year, that same year, on May 23rd of 1922, he fought one of the greatest fighters of all time, Harry Greb. Uh, and at that time, Tunney was defending his, his uh, uh, you know, American light heavyweight title. And it was a brutal fight. And, and Greb inflicted the only defeat uh, on Tunney. He he beat him badly, very decisively. He broke his nose. He cut him up. He sl his uh, Tunney's eyes were bleeding early in a fight. I mean, he was, he was really he looked as bad, if not worse, than Dempsey did after the two Tunney fights with uh, uh, that Dempsey had. And, and Greb won the fight decisively. Now Greb was one of the greatest fighters of all time, 
and uh, he wound up uh, winning a, the 15-round decision. However, when the fight was over, Dempsey said, rather, Tunney said in his, in his dressing room, I'm going to beat him. Let's get him again. Well, he, he subsequently fought, but that fight brought him to the attention of a lot of people because he put up a, gr- a, good, a good fight against a great fighter, older than him, mm-hmm. a much more better fighter. Uh, he subsequently fought the great Harry Greb uh, four more times and beat him every time. Uh, well, just to show you where, uh, how good Greb was, uh, in Bert Sugar's wonderful book about the 100 greatest boxers of all time, uh, he ranks Harry Greb, uh, I believe he ranks Harry Greb third, third behind Sugar Ray Robinson and Henry, and Henry Armstrong as the greatest fighters of all time. Greb, Greb was that great. Tunney beat him four times. Well, when he beat him you know, the first time and the second time, uh, by then people really started to pay attention. Plus the fact he also, uh, he fought a guy named Tommy Lochran out of Philadelphia. He was a great, uh, became a light heavyweight champion later on and was very impressive in that fight. And, uh, the, but, the, the, but the victories over Greb especially, by 1924, uh, uh, he had fought Greb, uh, he fought Greb for the third time, fought him for the fourth time in 25 and beat him. And by then he was starting to move up. Uh, Greb was only essentially a middleweight, light heavyweight. Mm-hmm. By 25, though, uh, that, that's approximately when, uh, although 24, 25, Tunney began to fight some heavyweights. He fought uh, George Carpentier, who uh, had fought uh, a very famous fight against uh, Tunney, rather, rather against Dempsey in mm-hmm. Jersey City, uh, the famous French orchard man. And uh, he knocked him out in the 15th round. Uh, Dempsey had knocked him out a few rounds earlier than that. And he began to fight heavyweights, and he began to, and he began to uh, uh, add weight. Never more than weight, weight around 180, 185 pounds. Kind of an overgrown uh, light heavyweight, even fighting as a heavyweight. Matter of fact, when he fought, when he fought Dempsey uh, both times in Philadelphia and Chicago, he weighed between 185 and 188 pounds. Not, not too heavy, even by heavyweight standards. But average for for the time, because average, Dempsey himself was the, Demp- average for the time. Because even 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 Dempsey, and they were both about six one. Uh, both the Philadelphia and Chicago fights. Uh, Dempsey just weighed about 190, 192 pounds. Uh, for that time, you didn't ha- you didn't have a whole lot of fighters. You had you had the Jess Willards who were, you know, who Dempsey uh, uh, knocked out to win the title in 1919. Who was six six and 250 pounds, but that was that was extraordinary. There weren't many fighters like that. Um, was so then after those Greb fights and uh, was there was there public clamor for Dempsey to specifically meet Tunney? Did he uh, create the challenge himself? There really wasn't. As a matter of fact, the fight that probably uh, brought him the most attention was 1925. He fought a very good heavyweight named Tommy Gibbons in New York. Now Gibbons, uh, two years earlier in 1923, had uh, fought Dempsey for the title, a very famous fight in Shelby, Montana, and Tommy Gibbons. Uh, extended Dempsey to 15 close rounds. Dempsey won the fight, July 4th of uh, 23. Won the fight from from Gibbons. Gibbons is a very very skillful boxer. And uh, now two years later, uh, Tunney fights the same guy. He was not that much older, so he's just two years older. And uh, he does something that Dempsey couldn't do. He knocks out Gibbons in the 12th round. Well, people say, hey, wait a minute. This uh, this fighting a marine, as he was called, having been in the Marines in World War uh, One, that was the nickname that had been attached to him. Although, in fact, the only fighting he did in the Marines was in the ring. Uh, and he, he, they said, hey, he he knocks out Gibbons in twelve rounds. Dempsey couldn't knock him out in fifteen rounds. Maybe we got something here. Well, the one who really saw that more than uh, anybody else was uh, Tex Rickard, the legendary promoter, uh, who promoted the at that time was promoting all the big fights in the country and uh and he decided hey, hey this kid's got he's he's an ex-marine you know world war one veteran he's handsome he's intelligent he's articulate uh you know he's he's um he's got matinee idol good looks you know he's a terrific boxer uh, they love him in new york you know and uh hey what a fight and they wanted to put it in new york but they couldn't because uh, there was a problem with the new york state athletic commission and so the first Dempsey Tunney fight, which came uh, the very next year after the Gibbons fight, after Dem- after Tunney had beaten Gibbons, was of course in Philadelphia. The Sesquicentennial fight. Let's let's exactly. let's talk about that. Right. 
Um, so, yeah, as you say, uh, Dempsey or Tunney did win 10 rounds. Dempsey, uh, I know, has uh, claimed that if it wasn't food poisoning, something obviously wasn't right with him that day. And there have been other allegations as well for, uh, you know, uh, let's let's talk about some of the other allegations. Um, there there has been talk that that perhaps the Philadelphia mob had some influence over that fight and over Gene Tunney as well. Well, let's take the food poisoning first. OK, uh, that was brought up by, by a, de- a detective, I believe a Chicago detective whose name escapes me, who was acting as a bodyguard for Dempsey before the Philadelphia fight. Was that Nick the Greek? Uh, no, not, not the Greek. It was, uh, I think he was, I forget his name. Okay. I think it was Dowd. I don't know why the name jumps out on me, Dowd. And, and anyway, uh, a year or two later, he, uh, he did an interview, and he said that uh, the day of the fight, actually, uh, Jack, he'd had dinner with Dempsey, uh, so-and-so, and Dempsey had, had developed severe food poisoning, and and he went into the ring the next day, you know, uh, really a sick man. Uh, Dempsey saw that story, was asked about it days later and denied it, said there was no truth to that at all. He did not have any food poisoning whatsoever. So second point uh, about the, the mob influence. Uh, it, it, I don't think there was any that was a factor in the fight. Uh, first of all, why would Dempsey have taken... Uh, such a beating if there was any kind of a fix on. Obviously, when there's a fix on, usually you go down, you know? Right. And here he, here he was being slashed to ribbons, losing every round. An easy way out would have been just to go down, and when he got hit by that first right in the first round, which, which would have knocked out most people, was the, first, was the best punch of the fight, probably, and the one that Tony threw early in the because he knew, he knew that Dempsey was vulnerable to right hand. And uh, in the first round, he, he jarred him, almost uh, knocked him out with the right hand. If the fix was in, he would have gone down. Uh, what what did happen? And there were a couple of unsavory characters involved here on the, on the Tunney side, and I don't think Tunney felt comfortable. Uh, one was uh, Max uh, Boo Boo Huff, uh, closely linked to, or indeed probably a member of the Philadelphia Underworld, uh, who was a very close was close to Billy Gibson, who was Tunney's manager. The other was A. Battelle, uh, former one of the great uh, featherweight fighters of all time. Uh, who, uh, you may recall, was uh, the intermediary between uh, the famous New York gangster Arnold Rothstein and the uh, Chicago Black Sox scandal mm-hmm. in 1919 when, when they threw the World Series to Cincinnati, at least eight of the players did. And uh, Abe, Abe Attell, a great fighter, Abe was notorious for dumping fights. <laughs> losing fights deliberately, mm-hmm. even though he won far more than he lost. Uh, to say the least, he was unsavory. Uh, the night before the fight at, at Tunney's, uh, at the country club that, uh, uh, I believe it was the uh, Glenbrook Country Club in the Poconos, Pennsylvania, where, where Tunney was, uh, was staying, he noticed that night, he saw A. Battelle and Boo Huff. Uh, at, at his training headquarters, and Billy Gibson, his manager. Well, you know, what are these two guys doing around with Gibson? And, and then the next day, the day of the fight, Tony's taking a nap. He's flown in from Philadelphia on a very famous flight that he took with a pilot, and a lot of people thought he was crazy for doing that in an era when not many people flew. Here he is flying the day of the fight. And uh, a lot of people thought that was a psychological ploy. Anyway... He's taking a nap, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, knock on the door uh, where he's staying, and here is Billy Gibson with who Who else but Boo Huff and, uh, and, it, and, it's, and another guy who turns out to be Boo Huff's lawyer. And, uh, and Tony wakes up and says, what, you know, what the heck are you guys doing here? And he's furious with Gibson. Gibson says, well, i got some papers I want you to look at. And one, one dealt with an agreement between uh, Gibson and apparently Huff dealt with some financial matter and and apparently uh, and Tony looked at it and then the second was a, was a contract that uh, uh, Gibson Tony's manager wanted uh, Gene to sign a long-term contract well Tony was furious he was so furious he threw the papers at Huff and uh, Huff's lawyer and also at uh, at Gibson and told him to get out of the room and uh, and try to go back to sleep, but couldn't. Well, that wasn't an unusual ploy. Apparently, managers quite often took advantage of their fighters on the day of the fight by asking them to uh, sign a long-term contract, and quite often they would because they were so focused on the fight, uh, they just took the, you know, uh, just put 
complete trust in the manager. Now, the fact that, that Huff was in Tunney's room hours before the fight, you know, led to a lot of suspicion. The fact that he was in the training camp the night before. The, the, the best that, that can be said about the, those suspicions is that, that apparently uh, Huff was betting a lot of money on, uh, on the fight, and uh, he wanted to uh, ensure that there be a referee who would at least uh, treat Tunney fairly. Uh, after the second fight in Chicago, or I think maybe before it, uh, Dempsey came out and, and uh, filed a suit alleging that, uh, uh, that, that, that Huff uh, had conspired with Attell and some others to, to ensure just that, to ensure uh, that they uh, know who the referee was going to be in the Philadelphia fight. I think that's as far as that went. But the very, the, the very presence of Abe Attell and, and, and Max Bubu Huff around at the Tunney camp the night before the day of the fight justifiably led to a lot of suspicions. Was it, uh, obviously, did that influence then follow in 27 for the rematch? Uh, it seemed that uh, one referee was selected. In fact, Benny Leonard was the one to suggest the initial referee, uh, from what I understand. Right. And it seemed like that the Illinois Commission was going to follow suit until... Uh, the protest from from uh, the Tunney side came up that uh, the initial referee, whose name currently escapes me, uh, you know, was a Capone man. Obviously, Capone had been very public in his support of Dempsey. So we, why don't you talk about that? Yeah, you know, the guy you're talking about was a guy named Davey Miller. Uh, Davey Miller was probably the best-known referee in Chicago. He also ran a pool hall and uh, and a gambling room, and uh, and and you know and and the so he but he was he was the the number one referee at least in the Chicago area at, at, at that time in the twenties, and uh, the word got around that uh, his brother, uh, Davy Miller's brother, had bet fifty thousand dollars on Dempsey to win. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the word also it also got around that Al Capone, in fact, Capone came right out and said that he bet forty-five thousand dollars on Dempsey to win. So uh, uh, the Illinois State Athletic Commission, which was considering Miller, thought, "Hey, wait a minute, this is too risky." Uh, you know, Miller's brothers spent this kind of money on Dempsey and the Capone money on Dempsey. Uh, no, we we we, we got to stay away from him, and they picked Dave Barry instead, who became obviously a central figure in the long count. And am I correct, too, that it seemed that in the negotiations for the fight, Dempsey and and I forget who Rickard picked as his manager. Again, I've got Leo. um, I can't remember his name, but again, it doesn't matter. What I want to say is it seemed Tunney was much better represented in the in the negotiations for the 27 fight. And it almost seemed that even though Dempsey had a manager of record, he was pretty much calling the shots for himself. He had kind of soured, obviously, in 20 by 25 with Doc Kearns and uh was trying to run his own show and really wasn't doing a very good job of it. Well, it was interesting. The, the, the manager referred to the, the guy was actually his business manager. And, and when, when they told, in fact, for the Philadelphia fight, uh, by, then, by then he had, uh, before the first Tunney fight, Dempsey had got rid of Kearns. Uh, they had disagreed over money. For example, Kearns was taking much more money, a bigger percentage than, than uh, most uh, managers did. He was taking 50%. Of, of of Dempsey's purses. So if Dempsey made fifty thousand uh, dollars, Kearns got twenty five, uh, which was a lot higher than the average. Was probably like fifteen percent. He was taking fifty. So sure, he got into the heavyweight championship, but still, and uh, and Dempsey just got fed up with Kearns. I mean, Kearns even told him how to dress, how to talk, and he got fed up with that. And by then, he was married to Estelle Taylor, a uh, Hollywood actress who was a pretty good actress. She was in a, a lot of movies. In fact, she was going to co-star with Rudolph Valentino in the movie in 1927 when Valentino died, or 26, I forget what it was. Anyway, she disliked uh, Kearns intensely, and uh, she was pretty outspoken. And uh, she almost became, in, in the eyes of a lot of people, uh, Dempsey's manager. And so I think she was instrumental in him getting rid of Kearns. So now he has no manager. But they said in Philadelphia he had to have a manager for that fight and also the one in Chicago. So what did he do? He picked his business manager, a guy named, I believe it was Norm, uh, Norm, Norm Meal was his, was his last name, his business manager. He made him a manager in, in name only. Basically, uh, Dempsey was calling his own shots along with his wife, who a lot of people thought really interfered and didn't know anything about boxing. And uh, so uh, uh, he had Norm Meal as the nominal manager while he, and that I think I think that hurt him. A lot of people agree that that hurt him in both fights, not having not having a manager. By contrast, 
uh, Tunney had Billy Gibson, who had guided Benny Letter to the lightweight championship. And Billy Gibson was a, uh, a very good manager. Um, was Is it fair to say that Tunney was able to devise his own attack? Is it Tunney who came up with his own strategy against Dempsey? And if he did, how, how was he able to come up with this, this game plan that shut Dempsey out for 19 rounds? He had he had some he had some very good people you know in in in, in his in his corner and, and definitely he did and uh, uh, but he was uh, the best one to compare him with, with would be with with Ali uh, I talked but I remember uh, having covered a lot of Ali uh, Muhammad Ali's fights and and he he used to drive uh, Angelo Dundee his uh, trainer you know. Uh, he drove Angelo, uh, manager and trainer Angelo, crazy because he wouldn't listen to him. He, uh, Angelo said, "You can't tell him, you know, how to fight. He he feels he knows what what he wants to do, what he has to do, and and, he, and he's usually right." And uh, Demp- uh, Tunney was the same way. Tunney felt that he knew more about boxing than not only his uh, you know his his manager Billy Gibson or whoever the ma- the preceding managers had been. He had a couple of others before that, uh, or anybody else in his corner. So why should he have to listen to them? And and they realized that they realized that. Uh, uh, Gene uh, Gene was, was very meticulous. Uh, Gene Tunney uh, uh, had a game plan for every fight. He said that was one thing that Dempsey never had. He said he said uh, uh, one of the great quotes by him. He said he said uh, Jack Dempsey probably the, the most intelligent man I've ever met uh, in boxing, but not in the boxing ring. Meaning outside the boxing ring, it's becoming a very successful. Restaurateur, you know, for many years in, mm-hmm. uh, in, in, in in Manhattan and in Times Square, but but he said he said Dempsey strictly fought by uh, by intuition, you know he fought uh, every, everything was spontaneous. Where Tunney admitted every fight he had, he, he was going to fight a certain way and in, 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 almost in a certain round because he studied every fighter. Uh, so meticulously, he he had seen three of Dempsey's fights. He'd watched so many of his fights. Every fight that was available on film, he studied them by the hours. Fighters didn't do that in those days. Uh, you know, athletes do it nowadays, watching film. And mm-hmm. NFL players always watching film. But but uh, uh, he he was more meticulous. And 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 and, and that in that sense, in that sense, uh, everything everything was plotted well in advance when he got into the ring. And he, in in, in essence, to answer your question, was pretty much his own manager. Um, let's talk about the seventh round. Uh, I have archival audio of Tunney saying that he heard the referee count two. He was down. He felt it was the luckiest night of his life. In spite of the fact that I was hit seven times in succession in the seventh round in my contest with Jack Dempsey for the world's heavyweight championship, was one of my luckiest nights. As a matter of fact, the luckiest night of my life. Yes, I was down. I heard the referee count two. I knew I had to get up, which was part of my professional obligation. But what to do when I got up was the important thing. I decided to stay away from Jack, and uh, it was a very wise decision, as the results showed. You tell me what you've come up with in terms of Tunney's perspective of of the seventh round knockdown. Well, he said, he he, he said, and... uh, and uh, I had occasion to talk to him uh, some, year, uh, some years before he died, and uh, and he he'd also uh, said this in, in a number of interviews. As a matter of fact, uh, within months after the fight, uh, he said that first of all, he said he never saw the left hook. Uh, the first punch that hit him uh, was he, he he missed a left jab, and uh, Dempsey came right over it. This is in Chicago, of course, the long half fight. Hit him with a hit him with a, a, a real good right on, on the left side of his jaw, and uh, followed that up with with a terrific left hook that Tony said he never saw coming. And the reason he said he never saw it coming, he said this, uh, you know, a couple a year or so later, he said that he had had an eye injured, his right eye was injured by a sparring partner. Who had who had jammed the uh, the glove of his of his uh, uh, of, of his left hand into Tunney's right eye and uh, inflicted uh, damage to the retina and uh, and Tunney, as a matter of fact, uh, was, at that time was tra- was training at the uh, City Crest Country Club in uh, Chicago and uh, and uh, I think that's out at uh, Lake Villa. 
uh, Lake Villa, yeah, Lake Villa, uh, Fox Lake, I believe, is out there. Mm-hmm. And and okay, so he, and he and he had the, the eye, eye specialist who uh, drove off from Chicago to see him. And this was a couple of days before the fight, and they said there was no serious damage, and they, they said no reason to postpone the fight. It's so, okay, he went ahead with the fight. He said because of the eye injury. Uh, he never saw the left foot coming, which was really the punch that really, uh, you know, uh, uh, led to his being knocked out. Uh, subsequently, uh, a tiny, a Dempsey landed a couple of other blows, but it was a left hook, uh, uh, far and away Dempsey's best punch. His knockout punch is what put him down. He said he he said he never saw it. However, he when he went down, uh, he said he he, he vividly re- remembered uh, a, a Barry, Dave Barry, standing over him. And and uh, counting when he counted her two, he 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 said he was he, he fully had regained his senses. Well, the the, uh, the, the pretty much the the uh, uh, common uh, knowledge is that uh, the timekeeper, as soon as Demp's, uh, Tunney went down, uh, the uh, timekeeper began to uh, toll you know up up to four for whatever. Meanwhile, Dempsey is standing over. Tunney, Mm -hmm. which fighters did in many states, could still do that at that era. As soon as you get up, they knock you down again. But but the rules had been changed. They had been changed at Illinois sometime before that. Also been changed in New York. And so by the time uh, Dempsey went to his corner, and now now, uh, Barry comes back and he starts to count. And by now, uh, the the timekeeper is up to uh, up to about up to five. However. Barry starts at one, and Tunney says he heard him say two. Okay, so if if uh, if they had if they picked up the count, it's kind of confusing in the Illinois rules whether he should picked it up picked up the timekeeper's uh, count, which would have been six mm-hmm. uh, instead of starting one. Uh, uh, so okay, so maybe maybe it would have been seven, as Tunney pointed out. It would have been seven, but Tunney said I could have got up. He says, but when I heard two, I figured, hey, I got I got seven more, you know, seven more roughly uh, seconds to, to stay down, you know. And he stayed down until it was nine. So his his point was that he definitely could could have gotten up uh, before the count of nine, uh, and he could have got up even early. He could have got up at the count of three or four, uh, but he stayed down because he heard the count of two and he listened to it. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Dave Barry, uh, uh, a couple of days later, in an interview said that he was convinced. He saw that when when Tuddy went down, he definitely was very glazed and dazed. But when he started counting, uh, as soon as he as soon as, soon as he started counting, he saw. Uh, Tony start getting up, you know, kind of, begin, and, and then he saw him sit there and take take the count of nine. And Barry himself said he was convinced that uh, Tony Tony definitely could have got up. What evidence have you found in terms of comparing the seventh round to the eighth round, where Tony was able to land the flash knockdown of Dempsey? Uh, Barry seemed to dive immediately in and start counting. In fact, that's a point of contention that that Roger Kahn points out in uh, in his book, and in fact has that great picture. Uh, where Tunney is not in a neutral corner, is is away from the action perhaps, but certainly not in a neutral corner. And Dave Barry, you see him lunging in with his first one as as Dempsey's on his rear. Uh, I yeah I you know I, I I don't think a whole lot uh, yeah Con I know did that in his book about uh, a very good book he wrote about uh, Jack Dempsey a few years ago, and uh, uh, I don't really put too much uh, uh, stock in that. Uh, I, I think. I think the, the 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 consensus seems to be that that Barry handled the situation in the seventh round knockout very well. Uh, I don't know about the eighth round uh, uh, whether whether he was a little too quick in starting to count over Dempsey, but uh, uh, there was never any great suspicion, to my recollection, unless there was in the Chicago uh, uh, media back in those days in the Chicago papers that uh, maybe there was something fishy here uh, regarding the referee, but. Most people, I think, even 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 Dempsey, uh, in retrospect, said later on, years later, uh, he, he thought that Barry had been had been fair. Yet, I mean, that, that, he, that he should have that he made a mistake. He should have gone to a neutral corner. Interesting point, by the way, that a lot of people don't know. The, the Tunney people have always said that, that, that the, 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 the uh, Illinois uh, uh, Commission had supposedly uh, Tunney people had gone to. Uh, Meet and Cooley Billy Gibson with the commission sometime before the fight, and, and had and well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The Dempsey people. This is the irony. The Dempsey people, including Normiel, his uh, manager, had had gone to uh, the Illinois Commission and and specifically uh, asked to ensure that uh, in in the case of a knockdown, that a fighter definitely go to a neutral corner. And uh, 
And, and well, why would they ask that? And the suspicion is that uh, Dempsey really was afraid of Tunney. Uh, and uh, th- th- that's, that seems to be a, a kind of a strange thing to say. But yet, uh, Tunney, for one, was always convinced that Dempsey was lacking in confidence and was always afraid of being knocked out. As a, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Dempsey himself lent a lot of credence to that supposition. He'd said some time before he fought Tunney that the main reason he knocked out so many fighters, he knocked out about 25, I think, as I said before, in the opening round, was because of his fear that should a fight go beyond the first three minutes, he always felt endangered, no matter the quality of an opponent. And and Tunney felt that Dempsey did have that fear. And it's one of the reasons why he came out so quickly, like like Mike Tyson did, and uh, for a quick knockout. And uh, and in 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 the in in the in the in the case of the uh, in, in in the case of the Chicago fight, uh, he did that too. Can you talk about uh, some of the things that Tunney did while he was in Chicago? He was here for a month. Uh, he came at the beginning of the month, and I know that uh, I've got some quotes and and had found in my research that uh, he. Uh, had they had a ticker tape parade for him? Uh, some of the other some of the other things he possibly did, or did he really focus on on training once uh, once camp began? Well, the difference between the two was was amazing. Uh, in training camps, as in life in those days, uh, they they could have been more uh, more opposite, more disparate. Uh, for one thing, uh, Dempsey in training camp uh, was in a room would pace the room, even when he, when he wasn't you know uh, sparring, and uh, uh, even his own handlers and people described him as a caged animal. He was like a cat. He was prowling around. He couldn't stay still. And if if he if he wasn't doing that, he was. And once in a while, he would calm down and play pinochle with his sparring partners and some others, or he would wrestle with them. You know, he was, he was very physical. Uh, Tunney, by contrast, uh, would be out there, you know, at, at Dempsey's, I recall, trained at Lincoln Downs. Uh, Lincoln Fields, I believe it is. Right, Lincoln Fields. Uh, yeah, right outside Chicago. And and uh, here 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 was Tony at the uh, Cedar Crest Country Club. Uh, again, tell you something about the guy. In uh, the first fight in Philadelphia, he trained at the Glenbrook Country Club. He played golf nearby at the Shawnee Country Club, very famous golf course. He played golf almost every day. I mean, and fighters in those days, uh, they weren't playing golf. You know, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, not many people were playing golf. Most people playing golf were wealthy people. Uh, which Tunney uh, was uh, fast becoming. So uh, he was playing golf. He was playing golf out at the, apparently, at Cedar Crest. Uh, he was reading. He was reading, I believe, at that time, he was he was consumed. That before that fight, he was reading Somerset Maugham's uh, of Human Bondage. Uh, you know, and then, of course, you know, you know about that. That's uh, that the fact that he was uh, reading and he'd be reading Shakespeare and the word got around among the famous writers of the era, uh, Westbrook Pegler and Damon Runyon and Paul Gallico and Grantland Rice. And they all poked fun at him, you know, uh, and thought thought he was a, a poser, an intellectual phony. And, uh, you know, what's he doing reading these books? And he'd even say to a, he'd say to a, a writers like, you know, I got to cut this short, uh, gentlemen. Uh, uh, I've got to go. I'm going to. I'm, I'm having lunch with Somerset Maugham. You know, he and, and they look at him like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> and he really was going to be having lunch with Somerset Maugham or H. G. Wells. You know, or or, or and so he would. Uh, to answer your question, he'd he'd be at the Cedar Crest Country Club. He'd he'd spar. He'd he'd, go, he'd read by the hour. He'd play golf. And uh, you know, this was not your typical uh, training camp. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Dempsey's training camp was was a uh, uh, quintessential. Uh, training camp of the era. You know, you, you had a lot of a lot of uh, uh, strange characters around, a lot of gamblers, you know, and a lot, a lot of boxing people, and raucous behavior, uh, uh, a lot of women around, you know, and it was just a typical t- training camp of the era. The contrast couldn't have been more different uh, than with uh, the, the training camp of uh, Jane Tunney. Why do you feel Tunney retired after the the one uh, fight after uh, after the twenty seven fight the Heaney fight. Do you feel that Tunney, uh, you know, had had basically run out of challenges? To to my mind, Jack Sharkey would have still been a viable opponent, especially given that he was winning that fight against Dempsey in twenty seven uh, prior to being knocked out. Uh, that's true. However, what, what what happened was that that in nineteen twenty. Ooh, it was 1927. I think it was the year of the uh, uh, the, the, the long count fight in Chicago. Uh, he was introduced to a beautiful socialite from Greenwich, Connecticut, named Polly Lauder, who was the grandniece of uh, Andrew Carnegie, 
the uh, famous Carnegie, of course, of the, uh, the, the seal business in Pittsburgh, and uh, from a very wealthy social family in, uh, in Greenwich, and uh, fell in love with her, and uh, they became engaged. And I believe they became engaged, I believe, it was before the, uh, uh, before the second uh, Dempsey fight in Chicago. And there's no way in the world that Polly Lauder wanted to be married to a fighter. And uh, so uh, the, the arrangement was she'd marry him as long as he, uh, you know, got out of boxing quickly. Well, he said, first of all, I can make, you know, I can make a million dollars fighting uh, uh, Jack Dempsey a second time in, in Chicago, which I think was the fight was already settled, already set. And that, by the way, was the purse, his purse, first fighter ever to receive a, a million dollars. The story is, by the way, he got a check for $990,000. And he gave Tex Ritter a, te- a Tex Rickard a check for 10000 and said, make about the check for a million. I want to be the first athlete ever to get a million-dollar check. And he was. And so now he's engaged to uh, this woman he's in love with. And uh, he's, got a million- he's a millionaire. She's an heiress. And uh, why go on fighting? However, he does agree to fight uh, Heaney, Tom Heaney, from New Zealand in his last fight in 1928. Uh, he knew he couldn't lose that. He knew he, he was not, not going to get hurt. And there's no danger at all of fighting Heaney, who at best was a journeyman. And uh, they were engaged now. He, he, beats, he beats Heaney in 28. And uh, then shortly after that, uh, he and Polly Lauder take off for Europe for about a six-month trip during which he hangs out with uh, George Bernard Shaw, and uh, he meets uh, Samuel Butler, who wrote, of course, The Way of All Flesh, and, and people like that, and very literary t- people. And October 3rd of 28, he marries Polly Lauder in Rome. Uh, let's say, to answer your question, I guess, uh, love got in the way. I think if he hadn't met, if he hadn't met Polly Lauder, he might have very well kept on fighting. And what do you think his chances would have been against uh, some of the subsequent champions like the Schmellings, the Sharkies? Oh, I think I think I think Sharky. I think there's no doubt he, he would beat Sharky. Uh, Dempsey knocked Sharky out. Sharky Sharky was pretty good, a good fighter, a good fighter. But uh, I don't think uh, he would have stood a chance against uh, uh, against Tunney. Uh, other fighters. Of, who was the other one you mentioned? Uh, Max Schmelling. Uh, Schmelling. Uh, I, you know, it, it, it's again, again, smelling like, like a Dempsey, uh, tremendous puncher. Okay. And, uh, uh, that, uh, a puncher was made to order for Tunney, a boxer. Again, the, the, uh, the, the best chance a boxer has is against a puncher. You could put two boxers in together and, you know, it can make for a very bad, dull fight sometimes. But I, th- I think he, I think he would have, I think he would have beaten Smelling. I, th- I think he was just too good. You gotta really, besides being a very good boxer, I mentioned before, you know, he knocked out 43 of 77 opponents and, and he, he resented the fact, he always resented the fact that, that as I said earlier, that people, uh, regarded him as solely a defensive fighter. He said, look, he, he, how come I knocked out 43 fighters? And, uh, you know, and, and I, obviously I, I could hit. And he could. And, and I think that had he been in with, uh, with someone like uh, with Schmelling and Sharkey, he might very well, very well have knocked him out. As a, as a former champion, um, what, what level of respect do you think he received from, from the fight fan public? You know, interesting question. Uh, and again, my, my friend, uh, and, and I, who I respect tremendously, uh, Bert Sugar, uh, without a doubt, the preeminent boxing historian, uh, I think, in the world. And again, the, the book of his, The 100 Greatest Boxers of All Time. Again, to show you how, although Bert, I know, uh, holds Tony in high regard, uh, he, uh, uh, guess where, guess where uh, uh, Dempsey is ranked fourth as the fourth mm-hmm. greatest fighter of all time. Tony is number 16. 16. Yep. Uh, that tells you uh, what the, uh, the the boxing establishment felt that, 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 that this was like a fluke. Well, hey, come on. He, he beat Dempsey twice, won 19 out of 20 rounds. Uh, people say, well, who did he fight? Well, he, he only made two title defenses. One was against the great Jack Dempsey. Second was against Heaney. But if you look at Dempsey's record, Dempsey only made five title defenses against guys like Billy Miskey, Bill Brennan, uh, uh, Tommy Gibbons, I mentioned before, and Luis Firpo, who knocked him down three times, once through the ropes. <laughs> and you remember the famous knockdown through the ropes? Absolutely. And in, in the, in the, in the uh, first round, whereupon uh, uh, right into the lap of a lot of newspaper men who pushed uh, Dempsey back into the ring. They loved Dempsey. Yep. And uh, as, as, as quite a few uh, people in the media said, had, had that been Tunney, they, they they wouldn't have touched him. They would have lie there in the you know uh, right in the press row until he was counted out. 
that's because of the disdain uh, the media had for uh, had for Tani, who they just thought this guy's a you know he, he's a poser, as I said, and he's, he's a, his intellectualism is is not really genuine. Uh, but but I think. Uh, uh, I, I, I think that that was that was the case with again so hard for him to get respect even 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 years later now when when the Burt's book came out and to uh, to put Tony sixteenth and I'm thinking Greb is fourth hey he beat Greb four times out of five fights how's Greb fourth and how is Tony sixteenth he beat he beat Dempsey twice uh, decisively nineteen out of twenty rounds Tony is uh, Dempsey's fourth Tony is sixteen. Come on, I don't understand this at all. <laughs> but 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 it's typical. It's typical. It's one of the reasons why I'm writing my book. I think I think he was probably uh, the most misunderstood uh, heavyweight champion of all time. Who, by the way, Dempsey, Dempsey, uh, Dempsey, uh, and he became great friends. And Dempsey had a tremendous respect for him, and he respected him far more than anybody else in the, in the boxing of size. But he became very very close friends, and uh, and and. Tunney didn't wasn't respected for another reason. He beat an icon. It's like when Hank Aaron beat Babe Ruth's home run record. People didn't want him to do it because everybody wanted Babe Ruth to hold that record. Babe Ruth was a larger than life sports icon. Same thing was true with Jack Dempsey. There were two great icons of the 1920s in sports: Babe Ruth and Jack Dempsey, born five months apart, by the way, in 1895. Which one of the two was bigger worldwide? Dempsey, far and away, was more popular and better known. And ironically, 27 was uh, their year of infamy, both of them. Exactly, exactly. As a matter of fact, uh, exactly was the year that, that Ruth had 60 home runs. It was the year of the, of the what is still to this day regarded as probably the greatest baseball team in, in history, the 1927 Yankees. And uh, Ruth, first man to hit 60, which was more than uh, most teams in the major leagues hit that year. And uh, and so it, w- it was indeed. It was also the year that Lindbergh flew the Atlantic. It was yep. a very special year. Um, so do you feel then it really was strictly uh, uh, Tunney's uh, marriage that, that kept him out of the ring? Do you feel that Billy Gibson's involvement with Buhuff might have uh, contributed as well? Did that did that drive a wedge between Gibson and and uh, and Tunney? You know, he got they both he got over that. Uh, Gene got over that. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, in, in, in a book he wrote, I think it's called Arms for a Living, uh, he wrote back in 1930, uh, 30, 31, whatever, uh, he, he, shortly after his retirement, he said, no, he said, he, said he, he, was, he was furious at, uh, at Gibson for what he did, you know, uh, disturbing his sleep. You know, how do you do that, you know, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 5 hours before the fight, uh, the biggest fight of, uh, of, of Tony's life. And, and uh, he, he forgave him for it, and, and apparently uh, Gibson apologized and said he shouldn't have done it. And they, uh, uh, Gibson stayed on. Gibson stayed on to uh, manage him in Chicago, also managed him at the, uh, in the Heaney fight. And uh, they, they, they remained, they remained uh, friends. They remained close. And was Huff nowhere to be found in those two fights after? Huff? Yes. Bo Huff? Uh, I think he was in Chicago. He, 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 he was in Chicago for the, for the fight at, at Soldier Field. Which incidentally, the you know the, the huge headline here of the New York Times says uh, uh, it was incredible. The, the the Times after both fights ran three ran triple uh, decker. There was three line headlines across the top of page one on these two fights. It was it was unheard of in those days for a sports event to be on the front page of the New York Times. In the case of the Chicago fight and the fight in Philadelphia, almost the entire front page of the New York Times is devoted to not only the main story, but sidebars about uh, uh, the Tunney fight. This, here's one second fight. There's 150,000 see Chicago fight, millions listen on radio. Well, in truth of the matter was, the Chicago fight... Uh, the official paid attendance was, I think, it was 105,000. Mm-hmm. As against in Philadelphia, it was 121. But uh, still, the gate in Chicago was was more than two and a half million. You know, that gate, John, two and a half million dollars in Chicago. Now, this is all live gate because there's there's nothing from television. There's nothing coming in from radio. Okay, mm-hmm. you're never going to see that again. Today, that would be 25 million dollars. Live gate. 
these are all people who were there. That's where all the money came from. It didn't come from any place else. And it was two and a half million dollars generated from forty dollar ringside seats and five dollar cheap seats. So that that range. Exactly. You know, forty dollar ringside seats and Tex Record was so smart. Tex Record ringside what lasted 132 rows back. <laughs> you could be sitting in the 132nd row at Soldier Field, which obviously was enlarged for the fight, and you and you and you were and you were paying you were paying forty dollars, and he, and they they call that ringside 132 rows back. It was almost like you're in the bleachers. <laughs> and that's that's one of the reasons why the gate uh, was uh, you know was more, more than two and a half uh, two and a half million dollars. There was clamor. There was clamor by Rickard for a third fight. There was, but uh, in, in truth, uh, what happened, uh, Dempsey didn't want a third fight, and it became very clear uh, that Dempsey didn't want one. Dempsey realized uh, he was only 32 uh, for the second fight. There was a three-year three year age difference. First fight, Tunney was 28, uh, Dempsey was, 20, uh, was 31, and the second fight, obviously, it was 30 and 33. Uh, anyway, rather, rather 29 and 32. So, uh, hey... After being cut up, having had his eyes uh, sliced up, you know, and uh, as Tunney himself said, he said he knew that Jack feared blindness. He, he, he knew a lot of fighters eventually went blind, taken pounding around the eyes. He was fearful of that. He lost 19 out of 20 rounds. As, as Tunney himself said, why would he want a third fight? The only one that wanted a third fight was Rickard. Tunney didn't. Tunney figured, what have I got to prove? What's the point of it all, right? And I won 19 out of 20 rounds. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the, the consensus among uh, people in boxing was, this time, Tunney's got it right. He's a, there's no point in having a third fight. And, and uh, Dempsey, uh, Dempsey did indeed go on, and uh, he, fought, he fought some more. What happened, sadly, uh, in 1929, uh, he uh, he lost four million dollars in one day. And the stock market crash. He lost everything. Dempsey mm-hmm. lost everything, and uh, he had to come back out and fought a couple hundred exhibitions around the country to uh, uh, get some money. And then he also, of course, opened up his uh, uh, very successful restaurant on uh, on Broadway and did indeed uh, re- regain, uh, in, in essence, most of his fortune. But uh, uh, the the last fight, the last actual fight he had. That Dempsey had was Tunney in Chicago, and uh, the following March, uh, he announced his uh, retirement. Quick question about uh, Tunney sparring right up before the fight, because it seems, at least in the published record of Tunney's record, uh, there are a lot of documented exhibitions, l- literally the month before the fight. And, and Eddie Egan, I know, was one of, was one of those guys that he was sparring with. I- am I am I wrong in assuming that that Tunney had uh, more? More con- more serious ex well, and again they're exhibitions, so maybe that's a mis- uh, misjudgment on my part. But it seemed like Tunney was training harder, despite his country club at- uh, attitude right. and and setting. But it seemed like he, you know, they were they were more organized than the Dempsey sparring uh, leading up to the fight. Is that wrong? You, you, you mean you mean uh, Tunney had a lot of exhibitions uh, while training uh, in, in Lake Villa, in, in Lake Villa. Yes, sir. Uh, he, may, he may have had, I think, for the most part, he sparred. Uh, if anything, ex- you talk about exhibitions. Uh, that You know, one of the reasons some people think that Dempsey lost both fights was he had not fought in three years. Mm-hmm. He, for three years, af- after after uh, knocking out Furpo, after he himself almost got knocked out in 1923, he spent the next... Uh, Three years doing nothing but exhibitions. He, he fought something like twenty, twenty-five exhibitions. I mean, he, he he'd fight sometimes. He'd fight four, five, three-round exhibitions in one night in the same place and knock out every one of the fighters in the first round. And uh, and, and then he came back and when when he, when he fought Tony in Philadelphia in twenty-six, he had not had a fight in three years. It wasn't uncommon. Uh, uh, Jim Corbett, who happens to have been Jane Tony's idol. And who he patted himself after, of course, Corbett was a great, uh, you know, the great dancing master, mm-hmm. one of the great heavyweight champions of all time, who beat John L. Sullivan. And in turn, uh, he hadn't fought in three years when he lost his title to uh, Bob Fitzsimmons, one of the great heavyweights of all time. Uh, Jess Willard, who uh, lost the title to uh, Jack Dempsey when Dempsey knocked him out in 1919, he hadn't fought in three years. Mm-hmm. So uh, Dempsey should have learned from history. Here you had two uh, two great heavyweight champions, Jess Willard and uh, and Jim Corbett, uh, both had stayed away for three years and then came back 
and they got knocked out. And, and, and here Dempsey goes and does the same thing. And he thinks he can go back in three years and fight someone like uh, Gene Tunney. I think that really did hurt. That hurt. He, even though he was boxing ex- exhibitions, he, he wasn't, he wasn't box, boxing world-class fighters, John. And I think, that, I think there's no doubt, but that, that did hurt him. And I think that, that hurt him more than the exhibitions you talked about helped, helped Tunney. Okay. The uh, and uh, the last question I have, and I appreciate your time, would be uh, just uh, Tunney in, in his uh, uh, retirement years. Uh, you know, I'm, and I'm not looking for dirt or anything like that, but just really how he how he spent those spent those uh, final years. Well, you know, he, he what he what he did is he, he further alienated himself. Even even though he was unpopular, you know, the the great irony of this they always say is, you, you know, that uh, because Dempsey uh, didn't go into World War One, he applied for a deferment uh, mm-hmm. for for his parents and for his wife, you know, and so on, so and so, and uh, and he was entitled to, it, and he got it, and so he he uh, he did, he 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 did not go into service in World War One, and of course, Tony did, and uh, and so he he he, uh, he was uh, lambasted criticized and a lot of fans would boo him when he came in the ring in those days and he was called a slacker you know and they really hurt him really hurt him deeply and yet and he was very unpopular the first fight in philadelphia uh the big the biggest cheers of the night definitely went to tunney not dempsey now here tunney beats dempsey which makes dempsey all of a sudden popular in chicago the biggest cheers when they were introduced was far and away were for were for, uh, were for dempsey who in losing as dempsey had said I had to lose to become popular again, and 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 Tony said, "The more I won, the the more unpopular I became, especially when I beat Tennessee." And so after he retires, he uh, he marries. So he's married to uh, he, he's a millionaire. He's married to a beautiful socialite. Uh, he builds a home in Stamford, Connecticut, in North Stamford, a beautiful home uh, on about uh, fifty hundred acres, where his widow uh, Polly, ninety five years old now, still lives. And uh, he lives there like a country gentleman. He he winds up on the boards of about uh, 12 corporations. He becomes CEO of three or four different companies at different times. He becomes a commuter on the train, you know, back and forth in New York. That's how I met him on the train, as a matter of fact. Uh, he he declines when invited to ever go to a big fight. He won't go. He just doesn't want to go and be introduced in the ring. He figured that's a phase of my life is over. What happens? The boxing establishment gets to dislike him even more and more, even though he's been long gone out of boxing. And uh, he spends his life as a very successful businessman. He he mainly uh, uh, hangs out and, and, and socializes with uh, uh, kind of a country club uh, set and uh, and also with corporate types, some of whom I've interviewed, people who knew him well, and, uh, and he was very comfortable with people like that. He went to the opera. Uh, went to concerts, uh, went abroad, kept up a long uh, acquaintanceship via mail with uh, George Bernard Shaw. I have copies of a lot of those wonderful letters they exchanged. And then in World War II, when World War II broke out, Franklin D. Roosevelt, president at that time, asked Tunney to become the head of the Navy's physical fitness program. He welcomed the opportunity. He went back in the service for, I think, four years. And uh, he, he'd been a physical fitness nut before it became popular back in the, in the 20s, and uh, he was perfect for the job. He recruited a lot of people who had been in boxing that he knew uh, to, to come into the service and serve as physical fitness instructors. And uh, so he led, this, he led this life of a country gentleman. He raised uh, 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 four children. Uh, all of whom went to college, all, all, all the, the, the three sons, uh, eminently successful. Of course, one John became a senator from California, and, uh, and he, he led the good life and uh, rarely seen out in, in public. You mentioned Eddie Egan. He would get together with Eddie Egan, his uh, longtime friend, a former Olympic boxing champion and head of the New York State Athletic Commission, and uh, they would have dinner after work, and, and he'd meet a few people like that. But for the most part, he, uh, he, he, he really scorned the, uh, the limelight. And I know, too, uh, and I've been talking to, to Bud Schulberg, that uh, he did kind of step out. And maybe one of the reasons, another reason why the boxing establishment maybe not maybe didn't like him was when uh, Bud wrote The Harder They Fall. Uh, Gene was one of the first to, to write a review of the book and, and really said it was an accurate depiction of, of uh, the way the mob was running boxing. Right. 
I think he felt that way. He became he became a, a very very discouraged. I know in the fifties and sixties uh, when you had you had uh, Frankie uh, Carbo and uh, uh, Blinky Palermo from Philadelphia, uh, two two uh, you know well guys who connected with the mob in New York and Philadelphia, mm-hmm. pretty much controlling a lot of the top boxers. And and there were, where there were several very uh, obvious fixes, one of which involved uh, uh, Jake LaMotta. and uh, and he became uh, he he became more and more uh, discouraged and became more cynical about boxing. And uh, I, I once asked him, I, I asked him uh, at the time I met him, I said, who were the, the, the uh, any fighters at all that you admire? And at the time, uh, Sugar Ray Robinson was in his prime and uh, still fighting. And he said there are only two. And I said, who are they? And he said, Sugar Ray Robinson and Archie Moore. Who, by the way, were both great boxers and also could punch. Similarity to Tunney, definitely. And uh, and I said, how about uh, how about Pat Floyd Patterson? How about Ingemar Johansson? How about Ali, who was just coming up then? You know, Cassius Clay. Mm-hmm. He said, no, I don't think much of any of them. And uh, I'll tell you, he was frank, if nothing else. Did he? Did he? Uh, was he asked to uh, testify in the Keith Offer Commission at all? I know he didn't have any. Not that, not that, not that I, not that I recall. Okay. That I, I'll tell you one funny sideline. Speaking of you know Washington, when John Tunney, uh, who became senator from California, was being sworn in in Washington, Jack, about the Gene, of course, went down with his family from Connecticut, and who did he invite to come on down to the swearing in? Jack Dempsey. Dempsey went down with the Tunney family, and uh, and was there on hand in Washington. When John Tunney was sworn in as a U.S. senator, I think Ronald Reagan was then the governor of California, and Tunney turned to Dempsey and he said, "You know, Jack," he said, "If it wasn't for you, you wouldn't be here, and and uh, I rather my son would and John wouldn't be here." And, and Dempsey said, "What do you mean by that?" He said, "Well, you you campaigned for him in California, which Dempsey did. Jack Dempsey went to California, campaigned for John Tunney. Tunney won a close race. Tunney says to Dempsey, it was because of you.'" If you hadn't gone out to California where they still loved you more than they loved me, John got elected. And, of course, Dempsey, being very modest, said, no, I don't think so. I think the kid would have done it on his own. But it was, was a great vignette. Dempsey alongside Tunney while Tunney's son is being sworn into the United States Senate. That's how close they became. Very cool. That's great. Uh, Jack, that's 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 plenty, and I and I appreciate that. There's some there's a lot of really good stuff here, and believe me, I'll make use of it, and uh, and and also credit my source. <laughs> yeah, I so. could I could I could go on and on about uh, you know, uh, uh, but I think I think a, a nice note. Some people wondered did they ever did they ever see each other? Did they ever like? Did they like each mm-hmm. other? They became very close, and, and and they had tremendous respect for each other, John, which which is a nice. And I thought that little tidbit at the end, which I just heard about recently, by the way. And uh, and I, I've dug up some material on that from the Times files. It, it, it all really happened, just like I told you. Well, I know, and I've seen, and I wasn't able to get access to it, but I've seen uh, some footage, and it looked like it was person to person or something uh, like along those lines, where they had a split screen of of uh, Tunney and Dempsey, and and both seemed very cordial to each other. And I've also seen no sound with it, but the newsreels of the '57 reunion in Soldier Field. Right. Where where they they broke into the waltz after clowning around in the ring a little bit. Oh, did they? Yeah, they. Uh, there was. I know it was the thirtieth anniversary, and yeah, they they both came back, and there it's was fifty seven. Yes, I didn't know that. I've got I've got to I've got to get something on that. Oh, absolutely. No, you definitely do. I know. I'll get it out of the Tribune. Uh, you know, sometimes files. So. Yes. No. It's it's definitely in there, and I know that there is newsreel footage of it as well because they ring a bell and and both come out kind of you know clowning around, crouching. They're in tuxedos. Oh, really? And and fainting at each other and. As they move closer, they finally grab each other and start uh, doing a waltz. Right, right. So, uh, no, that's that's cool. And I've also seen the photos as well in, uh, I believe it's Dempsey's book, in Madison Square Garden, the two of them in the ring, okay. and, and seem to be smiling and, and that. And I know that they, yeah, I know that they did become close, but that they was did. great. They got, to, they got together from time to time. As a matter of fact, he was the only one, he was the only one in boxing, the only one that 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 that, Dempsey, that Tunia ever actually really associated with in, in years and, and they had they established this very close friendship but even even when even when Dempsey lost both fights he he, he like uh, the, the, the famous uh, uh, quote after the first fight in Philadelphia he could hardly see his eyes were so cut up and he was bleeding and and he said, "Take me over to Gene." And and he had to, he had to literally be led by the arms over to Tunney's corner to congratulate him. He said, "Congratulations, Gene," and uh, that's, that that showed you the class of the man, you know. And and Tunney had a tremendous respect for him because he knew for all. 
for all of his savagery in the ring, you know, uh, uh, Dempsey, that was just him as a fighter. Outside the ring, he was about as gentle as they as they come. You know? Had you, had you met Dempsey? I'm sorry. Had you ever met Dempsey? Uh, yeah. Yep. I, I met him when he had the restaurant, mm-hmm. and uh, they had they had a couple of press conferences. I've got going back about twenty years. Uh, they'd occasionally have a boxing press conference in there, and I got a chance to to shake his hand and talk with him briefly. He's just he was just delightful. You know, he had he had this kind of high pitched falsetto voice, mm-hmm. which was, which was the strangest thing in the world. You you you, you look at this guy, you know, and he, even when he was in his sixties, you know, and seventy years old, uh, you know, husky, uh, looked like a like a former fighter, although no real uh, signs of it in terms of uh, a scar tissue or anything like that. Uh, and he and he had this very high pitched voice, and he was so gentle, and uh, it, it was it was a very special. As one who's met a lot of athletes, uh, meeting meeting De- De- Dempsey and Tony was, uh, I mean, uh, like 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 meeting my boyhood idol Stan Musial <laughs> was <laughs> was very special. That's cool. That one thing, cool. one thing. I don't know whether I, I, I think I mentioned that it's, it's crucial in, in what you're doing, and Bert Trigger might have picked up on this. That that the thing that that Tony uh, saw early on. In the Carpentier fight, when when uh, Dempsey knocked out uh, George's Carpentier in, in in Jersey City, the famous mm-hmm. fight at Boyle's Thirty Acres, and Tony fought on the undercard, and and after that he he sat at ringside with with a robe on over his uh, you know uh, trunks, and and he saw Carpentier land a, a hard right to uh, to Tony's jaw and uh, and jar him. And Carpentier was not the hardest hitter, and, and he also noticed it, it, uh, how Furpo. Uh, had had knocked uh, uh, Tony out of the ring with the right. Had knocked him down two other times, always with the right. And he saw that every time Tony was uh, Dempsey was about to throw the left hook, he kind of he kind of left an opening. It left himself unprotected. And 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 and, and so t- Tony, for, for years leading up to the fight, said to himself, "I'm going to knock. I'm going to I'm going to beat him with, with the first right I throw because it's going to hurt him." And he's going to be he's going to be afraid of it from then on. And it's exactly what happened in the Philadelphia fight. I'm glad you made that point because I had I remember reading and forgotten yeah. that Tunney was on that Carpentier uh, car undercard and yeah. was in his robe watching. So no, I appreciate yeah. that quote. That's very good. Okay, John. Jack, uh, thank you very much for your well, time. When, when are you when are you running your package? It's going to run the 21st. All right. And uh, it will run on the Chicago station. I am going to post it on the internet as well. Oh, good. Really enjoyed my conversation with Jack Cavanaugh from 2002. It uh, really provided some good balance to all the Dempsey coverage that I had in preparing that audio documentary about the long count. Again, Jack's book, Tunney, Boxing's Brainiest Champ and His Upset of the Great Jack Dempsey. It came out in 2009. You can find it at Amazon. Uh, He also had a great book last year about the New York Giants called Giants Among Men. How Robicelli, Huff, Gifford, and the Giants made New York a football town and changed the NFL. He also did a book called The Gipper, George Gipp, Newt Rockney, and the dramatic rise of Notre Dame football. That's from 2010. And then in 2012, he had the season of 42, Joe D, Teddy Ball Game, and Baseball's Fight to Survive, a turbulent first year of war. Really great stuff. He's a fine writer and, as you can tell, a great storyteller. So, uh, like I said, I hope to get Jack on a future episode of the Big Bout Podcast. We could re-examine his book, talk about, again, the things that he learned in the subsequent years uh, after talking to me back in 2002. The book came out in 2009. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Again, we will be covering uh, the modern uh, sport as well. Uh, But uh, I do think, again, there's great stories to be told about boxing's past that really haven't been explored. And uh, more long-form interviews that made up that documentary, our first episode. Uh, I hope you'll check them out. Uh, Subsequent guests coming up in the weeks ahead. The great Bud Schulberg, my full interview with him. Great thoughts from Bert Sugar about the old days. Uh, And also one that isn't on the documentary, Max Bear Jr. That's right. Jethro from the Beverly Hillbillies and the son of the former heavyweight champion. Uh, We focused on his dad and had an incredible conversation back in 2002. I hope you'll join me. Thanks again for listening to the Big Bout Podcast. Please subscribe to the show. Like it on iTunes. More episodes to come before the month is done because I want to give you guys a chance to kind of get a sense of what I'm trying to do here moving forward with the Big Bout Podcast. John Suntra saying thanks for listening. The Big Bout Podcast is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions. Copyright 2018.